Hello, and uh, my name is Alan Mumsden. Uh, I'm the medical director at the Heart and Vascular Center at Methodist, but currently I'm connecting to you from uh, Washington, D.C., where I'm at the Society of Vascular Surgery. Uh, this is a, the second of the CV Live webcast, but this is a special one, and it's special because it's the first of the events that we're are the lectures which we're going to present uh, sponsored by the International Society of Endovascular uh, Therapy. And so it's a real pleasure uh, to be introduced uh, to introduce Dr. Crazier. Dr. Crazier is a friend, colleague, and the current president of the International Society of Endovascular Therapy. Uh, he's the, an interventional cardiologist of great renown at our neighboring institute, Texas Heart Institute. And so, Zvonko, uh, over to you. Thank you, Arlen, for this great introduction. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, give this uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, start with a few introductory remarks uh, related to the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. Uh, uh, the International Society of Endovascular Specialists uh, is a global educational society dedicated in enhancing education and clinical expertise uh, in treatment of vascular disease using innovative technologies and interventional techniques to improve patient care throughout the world. I'm current president of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists, and Dr. Alan Lumsden is a president-elect and chairman of education of uh, this uh, society. The International Society of Endovascular Specialists is a multidisciplinary society. This is the only society that embraces and welcomes participation of all the specialists involved in the field of endovascular and vascular treatment of peripheral vascular disease. That includes vascular surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons, cardiologists, radiologists, uh, and also industry. And our motto is think globally and act locally. One of our uh, premier uh, achievements was establishment of the Journal of Endovascular Therapy, JEVT, that was established in 1994. It is a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, it has outstanding editorial board and uh, Dr. Alan Lumsden is a co-chairman or co-editor, uh, chief editor of this uh, uh, journal. It is one of the most read journals uh, on endovascular treatment of um, a variety of vascular diseases. It has a very high impact uh, rating factor and uh, archives are online. We are very proud uh, that we had an opportunity to establish regional chapters of our society. The first one was Arab Gulf chapter that was established in Dubai in United Arab Emirates in 2015. The second chapter was Indian chapter uh, with Asia Pacific uh, International uh, Society in New Delhi in India in 2016. And then Polish chapter of the Vascular Society in Warsaw uh, in Poland in 2017. And then we established the Houston chapter of our society in 2017 and the uh, Brazil chapter in Sao Paulo at CISE, very prominent uh, meeting, uh, the largest meeting in South America was established in April of 2018. And our final chapter was Mexico chapter that was established in Mexico City in August of 2018. Uh, here's a um, presentation of um, an establishment of the chapter uh, ISC research chapter in Brazil in 2018. Hope you will enjoy our uh, program that is uh, <coughs> being presented here. And my topic is laser-assisted transgraft embolization, a new technique for treatment of type 2 endoleaks. Here are my um, disclosures uh, that are not related to uh, this particular topic. One of the major concerns and issues with the transarterial embolization of type 2 endoleaks, which is the most common approach and treatment for type 2 endoleak, is that this technology is not very effective. And here is a particular example. On the left-hand side, we can uh, see uh, a patient that had an EVAR procedure and uh, no evidence of endoleak. 
At six month follow up, we can see that the patient develops a type 2 endoleak from communication between the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric artery, which was at that time successfully coil embolized. And we can see after coils that there was no longer type 2 endoleak. The problem with this particular patient is that the type 2 endoleak kept reoccurring and the aneurysm continued to enlarge. And he underwent four different coil embolization procedures to address this problem and the problem still persisted. So obviously this approach is less than optimal. So one very important thing about type 2 endoleak, that size of the nidus or endoleak is one of the major predictors of persistent type 2 endoleak. The larger the endoleak, the higher the risk of persistence of this particular type of endoleak. There is a simple type with a very small cavity that has one uh, ingress and egress vessel, so it's a single vessel uh, endoleak that very frequently closes spontaneously. This is very similar to formation of a pseudo aneurysm. And then there is a so-called complex type of endoleak where you have multiple egress and egress vessels and it, this particular type of endoleak behaves like AV malformation and very frequently persists and very frequently offers suboptimal results for, with interventional procedures. Now, another particular concern and issue is when we have anterior endoleak that cannot be reached easily from uh, the arterial approach or from the anterior approach or from the posterior approach because the endoleak uh, is in such position that it will be very difficult to access it. So how do you treat this type of a complex uh, anatomy? Uh, I have to give a, a token of appreciation uh, to uh, the inventor of this uh, new approach, laser-assisted transgraft for treatment of type 2 endoleak, Mike Mewison from uh, Milwaukee St. Luke's Hospital, Aurora. He's an international cardiologist and he had a vision to figure out an uh, easier way to treat very complex type of type 2 endoleaks that are not easily approachable either by um, arterial technique or translumbar technique or with anterior technique, uh, stick technique. Basically, he has been using a spectronetics uh, uh, laser and a variety of uh, angle catheter or a torquable catheter that is shown here and its position in the endograft uh, and uh, then uh, he has used uh, a laser uh, ablation catheter, very small, 0 0.9 millimeters, so less than a millimeter in diameter, and uh, a very small micro catheter. And uh, by activating uh, the laser, a uh, small puncture hole is uh, uh, formed in the, the endograft, and then we can advance uh, one of those 0.014 coronary wires uh, into the nidus and advance uh, the microcatheter in there, obtain an angiogram, and then use onyx to uh, obliterate the endoleak. So a little bit about onyx and, and unique. May I, may I ask you a question, Vonko? Yes. Do you choose the puncture site based upon the CAT scan, knowing where the nidus is? Absolutely. We're not using the angiogram as the main uh, uh, determinant where the endoleak is. Uh, CAT scan is absolutely mandatory and uh, not only that we are looking at the slices but also 3D images. We determine the, the exact location, uh, height uh, of the endoleak to determine whether it's on the left side, whether it's on the right side, posterior or anterior so we can angle the catheter and this is where this torquable catheters and a variety of manufacturers produce torquable catheters. We use typically six French or 6.5 French torquable catheters to uh, gain access to exact location where the endoleak is. So that obviously is absolutely essential step. A little bit about onyx. Onyx is a well-established embolization uh, agent that has been extensively used for the last uh, two decades for a variety of purposes, but uh, the first uh, use was for intracranial embolization of aneurysmal disease. The uniqueness of this uh, particular material is that when it uh, is in contact with blood 
uh, you can achieve instant solidification of this material. However, the liquid center continues to flow and uh, you have to prepare the catheter with a solvent, which is DMSO, that actually prevents uh, occlusion of the catheter during the procedure. It forms a spongy polymeric uh, cast. Also, what's unique about this particular material is that it uh, comes with a radio-opaque uh, substance, which is tantalum, so it's easily uh, visualized on fluoroscopy and uh, angiography as well as on the CT uh, imaging. So this particular material comes in uh, two concentrations, 18 concentration that's more liquid and 32 concentration that's a little bit more solid. And the operator needs to choose whether to use 18 or 32 depending on the extent of the endoleak and uh, amount of flow that occurs in the endoleak. Uh, there are numerous publications as far as the use of uh, onyx is concerned, either with translumbar or transarterial approach for treatment of type 2 endoleak. But uh, the information for um, the treatment of type 2 endoleak uh, with a transarterial or translumbar approach offers less than suboptimal results and frequently ends up uh, with 50% uh, uh, of the success rate. And this is what made us and uh, Dr. Muse and lead towards the use of. Um, this particular approach, this particular technique where we can directly enter in an easy way to the nidus and uh, use uh, uh, this particular uh, thromb uh, thrombotic material uh, to occlude the endoleak and inflow and uh, outflow vessels. Here is one particular example of a patient with um, a 6.2 centimeter aneurysm after successful EVAR procedure. The patient came for a follow-up at 18 months and uh, there was a relatively small amount of endoleak as you could see with the red arrow that was positioned posteriorly but the aneurysm continued to enlarge for more than a centimeter. So obviously this was a concern to us. Something had to be done to address this problem. Trans lumbar approach was not reasonable because this leak was positioned so posteriorly that uh, it was very difficult to access with trans lumbar puncture. And anterior access was also not a reasonable approach. And he had extremely torturous uh, internal iliac vessels, and uh, that was also not a very good approach. So we elected to use um, uh, trans graft laser assisted approach with onyx, as shown here. And the catheter was positioned, uh, again, using the information available from the CT scan. And again, the techniques was six French guiding catheter in this particular scenario. And uh, we used, again, echelon micro catheter and coronary wire. You can use any of the coronary wires uh, that you prefer. I typically use uh, the ones that are hydrophilically coated. I can torque them better and get into egress and egress vessels in an easy way. You can use coils to occlude those vessels first and then onyx after that, or you could use onyx uh, only. Sometimes we use coils to occlude the vessels first if it is easy to gain access to prevent any distal embolization of the material to the vessels that could compromise um, uh, the uh, basically tissues distally. And here is an example of a uh, echelon catheter into that nidus, as we can see it with a black arrow, and then injection of uh, onyx, a gradual uh, increase amount of onyx, and you can see actually the um, uh, inferior mesenteric uh, artery is also filling with the onyx. Uh, so uh, we can determine exactly the amount that's needed to occlude or obstruct all the vessels and also the nidus. And here we can see the magnified view and uh, the final result uh, on the right hand side with obtaining um, the angiogram uh, in the endograft. One particular issue that was of concern to a lot of operators that have been using this technique is what happens with that micro hole, 0.9 millimeters, in the endograft to gain access to the nidus? Well, nothing happens. Actually, the opening is so small that it does not have any significant consequences. There is no evidence of endoleak. And uh, actually, the onyx obstructs the flow to um, the, the nidus. So there is no need in putting any cuffs 
uh, to uh, prevent any embolization of the onyx uh, distally to the lower extremities. So uh, this is what you can see pre-embolization of the onyx and then at six months follow-up you can see the aneurysm is now in this particular patient decreasing in size and you can clearly see onyx at the site where there was previous endoleak. Here is one particular patient that was extremely complex and this is what I would call extreme scenario. Not only that this patient had a multiple type 2 endoleaks and very aggressive embolization elsewhere by multiple coils that you can see here, but also patient had a chimneys that you can see to four different vessels and had type 1A endoleak that that particular operator didn't know how to resolve. So we used the onyx in this particular scenario to inject the onyx in uh, the distal part of uh, type 2 endoleak and gradually build it up all the way to the origin of um, the left renal artery graft and with excellent results. The information uh, from the publication by Mark Mewis and myself was uh, published in JVIR in 2017 with our preliminary uh, experience and also explaining and describing this technique. Uh, our results in combination with uh, Dr. Mewison's experiences from 2011 to 2017 in 32 patients showed technical success of 98 percent, which is obviously significantly higher than in previous publications with uh, different techniques such as trans lumbar or trans arterial that have approximately 50 percent success rate. There were no major complications and 21 patients had a one-year CT with evidence of um, decrease or stable aortic aneurysm diameter in 86% of patients. Few patients needed secondary procedures, but most of the patients had a satisfactory result. Thank you very much for your attention. So, so Zvonko, before um, I show my presentation, do you ever fail to cross the, the graft? Does it ever slide off and you, you don't actually perforate into the uh, aneurysm sac? So, uh, as I mentioned, you have to establish the exact location from the CT. That's number one. Number two is we have been using uh, torqueable catheters nowadays because sometimes if you use just, let's say, mammary catheter or RDC catheter, uh, it might not give you adequate support. But torqueable catheters will give you adequate support. This is particularly important when you have an endoleak very close or at the proximity of the iliac limbs that will basically distort the shape of a mammary catheter or any other uh, steep angulation catheter. So a torqueable catheter will allow you to do that. We only had, I, I never personally had a failure in maybe 40 cases, but uh, Dr. Mewison reported only one failure to gain access among uh, 40 or 50 cases. And does it make a difference if you're trying to reform in the main body versus one of the limbs, or does it not really matter? It doesn't matter. Torqueable catheter can allow you to do that in the limb easily as well as um, in the main body. And onyx is compatible with all of the endografts? Is it something we need to worry about? Right. Onyx uh, has been used with all kinds of endografts. We have not seen any problems uh, with um, any of the endographs that are commercially available at the present time. I mean, you showed a great case where it would track down IMA. Is that usually what you see, or you just fill in the, the endoleak cavity, or do you usually see branch vessels? We do. We frequently see lumbar vessels. We're a little bit more reluctant to uh, uh, go directly into the inferior mesenteric if we feel like inferior mesenteric is one of the egress vessels, uh, we will frequently put coils in the inferior mesenteric first, or we will use a thicker onyx that will not easily flow into the vessel. And we will not inject directly into the inferior mesenteric, but we will inject in the cavity slowly and gradually observe the flow to the inferior mesenteric. Frequently it will stop about a centimeter or so from the origin, which is appropriate and sufficient and not risky. 
So you, so you mentioned 18 versus 32. How, how do you decide? I mean, do you really choose it based upon on what, I guess, is the, is the question? Right, right. So uh, typically, uh, if we are coil embolizing the vessels first, we will use more liquid type of uh, onyx. And, uh, but if we have a very relatively small cav cavity, we will use a, a thicker uh, agent. Or if we are not coil embolizing the branches, we will use, uh, again, thicker agent. OK, great. Well, so I'm just going to share my, my screen. I think we have a call-in number for anybody who actually wants to call in and ask questions. Uh, they're more than welcome to do that. So let me just share my screen, and hopefully you have that up. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we got that, I will give a little talk. Some of these this first introductory slides are the same ones as uh, Dr. Chinadurai used when we were talking about diagnosis of endoleaks. But let me just give a little bit of context to what we're talking about here. Um, this is the kind of standard endoleak classification. And so uh, I think Dr. Crazier, we're predominantly talking about uh, type 2 endoleaks, but you also ventured into treating type 1 endoleaks. That may be a little controversial. Perhaps we can talk about that later. So you're certainly not the only person who's doing that. Uh, but traditionally, the biggest problem, of course, with abdominal aortic endografts is, is the type 2 endoleak. And if we you can see that we typically follow these patients with ultrasound. This is the typical appearance of the aneurysm. You can see the two limbs, like the two eyes, and you can see flow inside the aneurysm cavity. And so in trying to choose these patients, the follow-up is for us is done predominantly with ultrasound, uh, but when you're planning the intervention, you really need a CAT scan. And so the Achilles heel of current infrarenal endographs happens to be what I'd now call the lowly lumbar artery. And when you open up an aneurysm sac, if you're doing this uh, through an open operation, then there's often a number of different lumbar arteries which are back bleeding. Remember, flow normally comes down into the aneurysm and away from the aorta through these lumbar arteries. But when we put an endograft in, flow reverses in these lumbars and comes back into the aneurysm sac and flows around it. And that's kind of what you're seeing on these uh, ultrasounds that we're looking at here. And so it's amazing. Uh, there's so little uh, has been talked about uh, uh, the anatomy of the lumbar arteries. And here you can see in this cadaver dissection, uh, these can be pretty big arteries. And we often think of them as being paired sometimes as in the L3 lumbar. Uh, there's a single lumbar trunk, and who would have thought we would be talking as much about the lowly lumbar artery as we happen to be at the moment. Now, this is a case with a type 2 endoleak that the endograft is underneath my fingers. The endograft, this is not endograft failure. The endografts work just fine, and you can see I'm pulling on it pretty hard. But there's the problem. The problem is intraoperatively, you can see that blood squirt pretty vigorously and that's just one of them sometimes there's more than that and that's kind of driven this cottage industry of re-intervening for uh, type 2 endoleaks now one of the things that we've been doing this is kind of an exciting picture actually because this is a dynamic CT and so the preoperative evaluation you'll see here is blood flowing in through the lumbar and back out through the aneurysm sac there and we're increasingly doing dynamic CT when looking at it Again, uh, Zonka, you kind of touched on this, and this is one of these areas that begs a classification system. Maybe you and I should sit down and do it, because you talked about how you looked at different approaches. Now, it sounds like you've settled on transgraft as being your best approach, but there are a number of different things that are described, and perhaps the original one was going translumbar. But you, you, essentially what you've got to do is look to see where the target vessels are. So we really vigorously try to define these target vessels. And then you look at where that endoleak cavity is because you really want to get your access into that. But you're limited by the approach options and it's affected by where the endograft actually is because the endograft is not always in the middle of the aneurysm sac. Sometimes it's anterior, sometimes it's posterior. Um, and sometimes it's really off to one side. So we look at where the targets are, where the endograft is, and then consider what the different kind of approaches are. And so uh, perhaps one of the real nice things about the, the transgraft approach is it gives you a lot of latitude in approaching different parts of the aneurysm sac uh, in terms of, of getting your access. And so just so that people have seen this, this is an example of uh, we were doing translumbar for a while. Um, you, we, we 
define this approach, plan it on the CT scan, use a thing called eye guide to see where we're going to drive this needle. And here you're seeing we're going through the psoas. Uh, we're avoiding any ureters which happen to be back there. You can't drive it through the bone, so you got to have a pathway that goes to one side um, of the lumbar spine. And then in this case, we went, remember the patient that's prone here, you go left translumbar. You couldn't go right translumbar because the endograft is right in the way. And so these are the, the considerations. And then on the, the right panel here, you can see that uh, we actually did manage to get into the inferior mesentery cordy. But catheterizing target vessels is very difficult. This is not easy, actually. The other approach that we kind of played with is transabdominal. We tend to do this if there is a big aneurysm. Here you can see we're actually sticking it. And in this case, because the aneurysm is up against the anterior abdominal wall, we're sticking it directly. And that allows us space intraoperatively to gain access. And I don't really want to go into that. And so. One of the things we've been more interested in recently uh, is the transcable approach. And I think you need to have options. There's none of these approaches basically are perfect for uh, a specific type of approach. And I'm going to, the, going to go into the transcable approach in a little bit more detail, but we'll come back to that. Par paragraph is another way. Here you can see the catheter is being driven alongside the endograph up into the aneurysm sac. And so Often you can actually get into that space between the graft and the iliac cord, get up into the aneurysm and drop a bunch of coils. But one of the problems when you do this is that the catheters are jammed between the wall of the iliac cord um, and the stent graft itself. And again, sometimes you successfully navigate into the aneurysm sac, but then you find you have almost no control of it when you actually get there. Any comments about these other approaches, uh, Dr. Crazier? Yeah, Alan, uh, uh, excellent presentation. I agree with your comments. Uh, one thing that's important that maybe I didn't mention, there are a few scenarios where we cannot use a transgraft approach, and you m touched uh, on it a little bit. Of course, if uh, either the limb or the main body of the endograft is in close proximity or right next to the endoleak, of course, it's relatively easy to gain access to it. But if you have a large amount of thrombus uh, separating the endoleak from the endograft, then you have a certain issues. How do you traverse that thrombus and how do you get to that endoleak? So this is why we use uh, hydrophilically coated wires, 0.014, and on few occasions we were able to actually go through uh, uh, <coughs> the thrombus. Actually, it's like a silly putty. It's relatively soft and you can maneuver hydrophilically coated wires to be able to do that, but on occasion it's, it's really challenging. So there might be scenarios where some other approach might be more reasonable uh, to address and resolve this problem, including the vena cava approach. So I absolutely agree with you. You have to be prepared to use all accesses, all modalities uh, to address and resolve this problem. So let me go on and talk, talk a little bit about trans cable. You know, that's just a completion for the um, paragraph. I'm going to talk a little bit more about transcable approaches. Now, let, let's deal with some semantics. Um, this is a transcable approach, but it's not really what we're talking about. Just so that if we're showing it in terms of dealing with inferior vena cava, if the only access to an aneurysm sac um, is through the left side, sort of the patient's right side, and, and actually traverse the inferior vena cava with the catheters, and put a sheath in there, then, then we've done that. I don't think that's something you need to worry about. It's not ideal, and I'd prefer going the other side, but that's another example of transcable approach uh, to the uh, aneurysm sac. But what we're really talking about is, is this. And, and so we start off with, with fusion, and anytime you see something rotating like this, this is one long movie we're going to show here. This is an example, basically, of how we set up fusion. And so let me just stop this for a minute. And so what we're looking at looks completely haphazard here at the moment. But we, what we've done now is take the preoperative CT scan. And I agree completely with you, Zonko. The, the, the CT scan is absolutely critical. And one of the things that uh, we've done is refine how we get that CAT scan. One of, uh, the, the challenge is, is that when you send for a routine endoleak CT study, you tend to get pre, you get post, and you get delayed studies. 
Um, well, I don't really care what's going on in the liver, and I don't really care too much what's going on in the, in the lower part of the pelvis. And so what we tend to do is invest the dye and the, and the, um, the radiation specifically on the endograft itself. And, that's, and so we scan and in this dynamic fashion. We will repeat that scan very rapidly, basically, in the force scanner. So we try to optimize the imaging uh, specifically for the task at hand. And in this case, it is trying to figure out where that blood flow is actually coming from. So once we fuse the images together, so this is the CAT scan that's been done with a cone beam CT scan, then all of these little marks that we get there basically are different kinds of targets that we're looking at. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're looking at. The, the green line here, for example, is a lumbar artery, a fused lumbar artery. And we'll show you just how remarkably accurate this fusion can sometimes be. So I'm gonna let this run here for a minute. Um, we've got access into the CAVA. Uh, we did shoot a CAVAgram uh, just to make sure uh, we no, there was nothing in there. We really probably didn't need to do it since we already had had the, had the CAT scan uh, preoperatively, and we had actually chosen on the CAT scan the crossing point. Now I happen to be part of uh, an SBIR review, and they were uh, companies were developing techniques for transcable transiotic access for TAVR, and so there's quite a lot of information out there about trying to avoid an area of calcification trying to choose a crossing point that is less than four millimeters separation between the cava, you know, and the aorta itself. And so what we've done here, these squiggly lines represent the lumbar arteries and the endolite cavity uh, that we're going to get access into. And so I'm going to move this forward just a little bit. And the way we did this is we used the Rosh Hashida needle. So here you can see the cavagram. Cavagram was no, pretty normal. One of the reasons we did that is we really wanted to shoot one at the end and make sure there was no extravasation and compare and contrast the two. You can see basically where the iliac veins were coming together and you can see that little circle. When we optimize the image and get the right angle, that's where we're going to try and traverse from the cava straight into the aorta. Mm -hmm. And so at this point in time, we changed this out for this, uh, the, the Rosh Hashita needles is what we're going, we're going to use to, to do this. And so let me just show you, this is from the TIPS world. Uh, it is an inner cannula and it has a needle which is shaped, the catheter, the sheath and the, the, the needle, the stilet is shaped. And what we're doing is putting this into position. Now, this doesn't go over a guide wire at this point, you're aligning the end of the delivery catheter with that green hole and we look at it in multiple different directions. So you line up in this particular view then we'll look at it in orthogonal view and make sure uh, that we are in the appropriate direction. Now Zonka you may be able to comment on some of the transeptal uh, access systems that uh, are available up in the cath lab uh, because once again this is this the Rosh Hashidal need is not perfect for all of these because it's got a relatively tapered angle. See, the the angle is not that acute and sometimes it deflects off the aneurysm sac. So any insight into uh transeptal needles, do you do that? Well, uh you know one technique that has been very successfully used for uh tavern type of procedures uh with the cable approach was uh using 0.014 wire, the stiff part of the wire, uh, and uh, use a cautery, basically to uh, use electricity to uh, <coughs> open the communication between uh, the inferior vena cava and the aorta. Of course, this is relatively easily achieved in scenarios where you have normal aorta and plenty of space uh, in uh, the aortic uh, cavity, but uh, when you have an endoleak and you have a very small cavity, the target is significantly smaller and might be a little bit more challenging, but I don't know if you tried that approach as well. That certainly is one other option there. Yeah, and so what we're looking at here is the needle has been advanced. Uh, we're looking at it in both directions. Uh, what, what's very different, you know, in these kind of approaches from what you're doing is that we're planning to get that uh, shapeable catheter inside the aneurysm side. We're not just going in with a microcatheter. Um, we're planning to get true access inside the aneurysm sac and then start working with, uh, it gives us the latitude of a variety uh, of diagnostic catheters, shapeable catheters that we can actually use. And so that, so this first pass, we didn't get in it. And you see how it's deflecting a little bit? Right. Yeah, it's deflecting up against the wall of the aneurysm sac, so I had to change the angle a little bit 
and then more or less pop this through. So we're changing the angle a little bit here. We always check it in two dimensions before we pop it through. See, here we're trying to look straight down the barrel of the gun. That circle is where we want to try and cross from the um, the cave into the order. And you almost have to pop it in. You push on it, it just tends to back the needle up. You pop it, and it tends to go in. Then you can put an 014 wire down through the middle of this. So at this point, we're pretty happy that we're inside the aneurysm sac. And then you, you back out the needle to try to fall out with the catheter. Sometimes you've got to dilate up that hole uh, a little bit. And again, we use you know a, a balloon, no one for a balloon, use a two or three millimeter to dilate up that hole. Sounds dramatic, but patients seem to tolerate it remarkably well. So once you get access to the aneurysm sac, uh, then we used, we, we changed out the wire and we crossed it with um, this is where we're about to advance and one of the tour guide sheaths is what we use to get access inside the aneurysm sac and I've found that to be remarkably useful because even when it's embedded in clot inside the aneurysm sac the tour guide is shapeable and will allow you to deflate the catheter. In this situation we, wa we wanted to do a 180 degree bend uh, to get to the bottom of the aneurysm sac so we've entered the aneurysm sac above the target with the expectation that we can uh, redirect the catheters once we're in there back down to the inferior part of the aneurysm sac. So we'll wind it forward just a little bit and let you see how we, we got in there. Here's the, sh the tour guide coming up. That's the tour guides now in the aneurysm sac. And you'll see it flexes pretty well you know, because it's clearly embedded in clot at that point based upon the CT and this has allowed us to direct it uh, towards the inferior end of the aneurysm. Now, as you can see, there's been previous, almost all of these spaces have had previous attempts at emb embolization, in this case with coils in the anterior part of the sac. Um, whenever you see these funky lines moving, it's because we're changing the angle of the image intensifier. It hasn't quite caught up yet. So we're shaping the tour guide. We want it to come back down to the bottom of the aneurysm sac. Now it's pointing anteriorly, which is where we don't want it to be. You can deflect it posteriorly, which is where we do want it to be. And we'll let it run a little bit. And if possible, we try to access the lumbar arteries, but I'd say that's probably 25% uh, we can actually truly get into it. But you see how that's an interesting component to show you. I'm going to stop it. So right there was what that showed. If I can go back to it here, was that we were right on top. I'm going to go back one. Was we were right on top of the um, in terms of the accuracy of the targeting. We were right on top of it at that point in time. And so what that showed was the presence basically of that uh, there's lumbar arteries. The fusion basically is very accurate. And once we've done that, um, we go ahead and embolize uh, that uh, the lumbar arteries uh, in their own right. And then we always scan them right at the end, basically, of the case. We actually get another cone beam CT just to confirm that we actually got the coils exactly where we want. But the fusion, basically, is remarkably effective at showing the presence, basically, of these lumbar arteries. Is it just a completion study showing that we're in the place where we wanted it to be? So. I think that it's good to have all of these different options basically available. Um, comments or questions, Uncle? I'm going to see if I can pull. Uh, I want to show that part of that one more time uh, while you're talking about it, if yeah. I can. Alan, very elegant uh, way to show uh, the benefits of fusion imaging and this particular yeah. approach in complex anatomy where maybe the other options are not reasonable. So I think it's, yep. a, it's a great educational tool, what, uh, what you have just shown here. And I have to congratulate you on being able to use all the technology that is currently available to address complex uh, anatomy. I think it was a very impressive uh, presentation of this particular access and uh, uh, information. Maybe uh, a few uh, very basic comments on uh, type 2 endoleaks uh, that uh, uh, everybody should know and would like to know. Uh, you know, there's a general comments uh, and understanding that type 2 endoleaks are benign. 
Yes, they're benign in, in a lot of instances, but you do have uh, occasionally scenarios where the aneurysm enlarges just because of the presence of relatively small endoleak. And this is particularly of great concern in large aneurysms that are seven or eight centimeters in diameter. We, we know that the aortic wall gets deconditioned and it's much easier for it to rupture. So there are concerns. You should be following those patients and surveillance is extremely important. So uh, there are has to come a time when the aneurysm enlarges, you have to type to endoleak where you have to address this issue. What is your approach? When do you treat endoleaks? Do you treat them uh, at the time of the procedure? Uh, do you do preemptive treatment? Do you do a treatment uh, after one month follow-up if they're still present or six months or only when the aneurysm continues to enlarge? Yeah, so great point. Um, and you, as you know, there's been a whole lot of debate about what to do about these endoleaks. They, they are not benign. In fact, I've lost a patient who ruptured from a type 2 endoleak. Now, she was very elderly. We'd already made a decision not to intervene on her again. Um, but she came in, ruptured, and died. So it, they're not benign, uh, and people can succumb to them. So. By and large, you know, if we see greater than about five millimeters growth, we will go ahead and intervene on that particular patient. And one of the problems is when you do an intervention on them is you, you can't tell probably for another year to two years whether you've actually successfully reduced the pressure in the sac. And so it drives a lot of the imaging that is required and then a lot of the re-interventions. I've become a little disillusioned about type 2 endoleaks because I've tried, you know, a variety of different approaches from that, and I'm still not entirely sure that we've got a handle on this. In fact, I know we've not got a handle on it. And so um, we have used much less in the way of onyx and endoleaks. We've used it a lot in AVMs, but we've really not used it as much as you have in endoleaks. And so I'm fascinated by your uh, kind of intermediate term data. You've got data up to about a year. Do um, you have anything beyond that? Do you think that this is going to hold up to two years and should we be switching over to onyx versus uh, coils? Well, uh, so there are certain disadvantages of onyx. Number one is that you have seen from the images, uh, onyx is uh, such a dense material because of the tantalum powder that's in it that uh, it is difficult on a follow-up to see if you have any endoleak because you have this dense material that could be hiding an endoleak. So you have to be very careful in looking uh, pre-contrast, uh, contrast and post-contrast images to assess it. And also obviously you have to look at the aneurysm diameter. So that's one of the drawbacks. The second drawback is that not everybody is familiar and feels comfortable in using onyx. There could be serious consequences such as embolization to uh, visceral vessels that could have a catastrophic uh, outcomes or embolization distally through the graft if you're not careful. And I, I've seen that happen with some of the individuals that were novices in using this particular technology. So, so that, that is obviously of, of concern. As far as technique is concerned, it's very, very simple, I would say, very straightforward. And uh, that is not hard to learn. What's hard to learn is when to use it, how to use it, and how to use it safely. So, and again, it, it's not going to be panacea. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, uh, we could have an endoleak from uh, inferior mesenteric, uh, four pair of lumbar arteries and so on, and one might be active at one point of time and the other one is active at another point of time. So obviously we address and treat those that are seen at that point of time. But I have seen on numerous occasions, as I have shown in one of the first images where we had to treat uh, type 2 endoleak on four different occasions because on one occasion there was only one set of lumbar that was a problem and then the patient comes again with another particular problem. So nowadays we are very aggressive in uh, treating everything that we see as, flow, as well as inflow and outflow is concerned because know that potentially we know potentially this could be a problem in the future. And that is something uh, that we have to take seriously into consideration because typically a lot of international will say, okay, I addressed this problem, this branch is occluded and it should be fine. The predictors of endoleak are also very important. Number of vessels, 
how large those vessels are. This has been published and clearly established. And also, the particularly frustrating aspect is patients on anticoagulants. This is where I see it very frequently. And uh, I have seen it also in patients, I don't know if you have similar experience, with new malignancies. They will have some kind of a tissue release factor and uh, form new neovasculature and uh, develop endolics. This is not very commonly publicized and known, but in my experience, I've seen six or seven or ca 10 cases where the only explanation for appearance of endolic was new malignancy. So our residents um, rotate on the new radiology service, and they came to me the other day and said, you know, a lot of, some of the spine surgeons have the neuroradiologists embolize the lumbar arteries before they do spine exposure. And I know that they also do segmental endocostals actually up in the chest uh, for the looking at spinal AVMs. And the question to me was, well, if they've got a big artery, uh, a big lumbar artery, why don't we take it out preemptively before we put in uh, an endograft? You ever done that? Mm -hmm. I have done it and I have abandoned this. This has been tried uh, from the very beginning when endografts became available. Uh, uh, there is one particular vascular surgeon that trained at, uh, with Dr. Michael DeBakey, Wolf Stettler from Germany, from Munich, and you, you know, probably know him well. Uh, he has tried this very aggressively in early experiences and he had multiple complications including paralysis. Well, what happens is you're fishing for the lumbar arteries in a cavity that's full of thrombus. There's always a risk that you can embolize that thrombus either distally uh, in the lower extremity or through the inferior mesenterical lumbars. So that approach has been in general, I think for most purposes, abandoned as uh, not beneficial and potentially, potentially risky. There are other techniques uh, basically uh, injecting uh, thrombogel material that thrombosis the cavity and branches uh, and uh, that's done at the time of the procedure with additional catheter that's placed there originally and uh, some operators are using this at the present time particularly when they see a lot of collateral branches present with the aneurysm. So I want to make a pitch for our annual meeting actually because I think there'll be an opportunity uh, for folks who come to that. This is in September, it's the ISABS meeting, and it's going to be specifically focused on hands-on activity, and I think embolization and teaching you how to use onyx is going to be one of the things that we will feature at it. So I would encourage people to come and learn uh, safe utilization of onyx. Now one of the tricks that uh, one of, Orlando Diaz is one of our new radiologists, he taught me was uh, when you use an onyx to use the roadmap function. And so what it does is you, you know, because as you know, one is it's black when you put it in the image intensifier, and then it's difficult to see the next lot of onyx coming in on top of it. And what he does is he uses roadmap that subtracts the old onyx, so you see the new onyx when it's coming in. It's kind of a very useful little technique, actually. Have you ever got a catheter stuck? Uh, no, it has never happened to me, but. Uh... And, and again, uh, that's why you uh, put a DMSO in there, and that is very useful. The problem also with, uh, with the microcatheters and the onyx, once you start injecting onyx, you cannot do any more angiogram through the microcatheter. So really, you don't see uh, the cavity angiogram at the end of the procedure, and you don't know what your result is. That, that's, that's the deficiency of this particular technique and you hope that you occluded everything that you need to occlude. And uh, so the only way how you can verify this is by doing the aortogram and then looking at the branch flow and see if everything that was of concern is occluded. So do you ever try to make a bigger hole and, and get a, a sheath in there? Because what you're saying is exactly one of the challenges is that you get one shot at this. Once you start putting onyx through the microcatheter, you can't exchange over a wire and you can't inject through it and so you basically got to pull the, pull the catheter out and start again if you really want to uh, restudy it. Um, can you delete up that hole and put a four friend sheath through it and then not lose access? Well, uh, I don't know what would happen if you make a larger hole. 
and uh, we tried to avoid uh, using bigger cutters. On few occasions, we used the 1.4 millimeter laser uh, cutter, which is larger than 0 0.9 that we typically mm -hmm. use, and we did not have any problems. So there is a possibility that you could actually put a smaller um, uh, cutter within the larger cutter, and then once you think you have optimal result, pull uh, the micro cutter out and leave uh, the larger cutter in there for, for an angiogram. That certainly is a possibility. We have done uh, on several occasions uh, uh, multiple punctures where there are multiple endoleaks. One could be higher up the main body and the other one is further down closer to uh, the limbs or at the limbs and we have not seen any particular issues with smaller holes but I do not know uh, what a larger hole would be like. As a matter of fact, I believe that when Mark Mewison started and initiated with this technique, uh, he used a larger catheter and uh, he was of concern there could be an endoleak. So in his first couple of cases, he put a, a like a iliac limb there where the entry opening was, but then he decided to use a smaller catheter and he didn't have any leak and he decided this was probably a better approach, better technique. So there are uh, several options obviously available. So the, the, the laser source is just a spectronetic source that's um, used for laser lead extraction? Uh, correct. It's exactly the same device. So mm -hmm. most places probably have that sitting around then actually. Absolutely. I'm convinced that basically every single hospital has it because uh, it's very, very commonly used. Now, one thing that I might add, and I think you mentioned this uh, very appropriately, that your neurointerventional radiologist, Orlando Diaz, uh, helped uh, and is helping in establishing this technique at your institution. I think one way how to learn it, how to do it well, is uh, work together with your interventional radiologist. All of them have proficiency in using onyx and microcatheters, and that's how I started with Dr. Michael Mawad and uh, Barry Toombs, uh, and uh, they have helped me a great deal in learning the technique uh, of using onyx and microcatheters for this particular application. Yes, yeah, fascinating. I, I gave a talk here in uh, the SVS last night, and I talked about the other guy's toolkit, and I featured Orlando on it because I think of all the, all the specialties, uh, new radiology has taught me more. Um, and, and getting out of your comfort zone and seeing what the tools are that are up in the cath lab, the new radiology space, I think is fundamentally important. I'll give you an example. Was um, I had a patient with a huge carotid body tumor, which I really didn't relish taking on surgically until it was embolized. And I got Orlando to come, and um, and we were going to do transarterial embolization. And so, and he shot the uh, internal carotid. Say, oh, you can't embolize this. It was shunning right through into the posterior circulation. He said, you can't do it transarterial. He said, let's do it transcutaneous. Now, the teaching in my world was that you never stick a carotid body tumor for a biopsy or anything else because it is so vascular. He said, no, 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 no. Let's just, you have a special butterfly because it's got to be DMSO and onyx compatible. I mean, he sticks about 20 of these needles into the patient's carotid body and embolize them perfectly uh, transcutaneous. I had never heard of it. And yet there's quite a lot written about it in the new radiology li literature. So there's a lot of smart people in everyone's institution and it's well worthwhile just dropping by and seeing what they're doing every now and again. That's that's a very good point. I didn't know that there was a butterfly needle, the DMSO and the Onyx compatible, because uh, mm -hmm. I, I do. Yeah, I, right one. <laughs> I use a, I do I do a lot of venous work uh, with Venusil, and uh, I do it for varices as well. But um, mm -hmm. none of the needles that I have used so far are. Onyx uh, or uh, you know uh, that particular material compatible, so they clot right away. Yeah, we well we made that mistake uh, when I tried it, but uh, that, again the advantage of talking to uh, somebody who uses Onyx all the time is they knew exactly what the compatibilities were, and it's it's a long day when they keep including them within seconds of you trying to use it. Right. So we're into the last five minutes. See any final comments you'd like to make, Dr. Crozier? Well, uh, one thing that uh, we kind of touched upon uh, a little bit, but maybe we didn't elaborate it to the uh, detail. 
I think it's uh, extremely important, and this is what our society, the International Society of Endovascular Specialists, promote, this camaraderie and friendship and interaction between different specialties. You are a vascular surgeon. I'm an international cardiologist. Orlando Diaz is an international neuroradiologist. We should all work together, learn from each other, and we can offer better results to our patients and advance uh, the technologies uh, in the future much faster than if we work individually. And uh, don't, don't believe in this interaction, camaraderie, and uh, working together. Yeah, one of my best friends when I was at Emory was uh, Jeff Marshall, who you probably know. And he was an interventional cardiologist. And uh, we decided to start a carotid stent program. We figured that they couldn't fire the chief of vascular surgery and the chief of cardiology at the VA at the same time. So there's a certain amount of safety in, in working together. Right. And we had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, bringing the expertise from both specialties, I think, benefited everybody. So uh, just to give you one particular comment, and personal experience as far as this uh, working together in different specialties. When I started with uh, carotid artery interventions, that was 1995, uh, they would not allow me to do it at my institution on my own. So I invited Michael Mawad, who at that time was at Methodist Hospital, to come and assist me. And he, w he gladly did it, and he was of great help, and we did the first procedure, of course, that raised a, a lot of uh, discussion and arguments and uh, trouble for me because, uh, number one, uh, it was communication between two specialties from two different institutions doing something that has not been done, so on. But eventually it was of benefit because that's how we established the program and developed the program of carotid artery interventions, carotid artery stenting. So I have to be very thankful to a neurointerventional radiologist in. Uh, helping me uh, develop this uh, technique at our institution. All right. Well, I think we're getting towards the end of the hour. Uh, I really appreciate you participating in this and um, look forward to doing this again. And we plan this to be the first of a series of lectures from the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. And uh, we're trying to move the didactic part of the meeting online uh, in this kind of format so that we can really focus on getting people on the different models, get their hands on the devices. Uh, really feel if you're going to come to Houston, you're going to fly to Houston, you should be in Houston to learn how to do something with your hands or for kind of this kind of to and fro that you get with the, with the faculty. So you're the president. I'll, I'll give you the final comments and then we'll sign off. Well, thank you, Alan, for the opportunity to uh, participate in this program. And again, uh, you mentioned it previously. I would like to mention it again. Please join us at uh, the first International Society of Endovascular Specialists meeting here in Houston in September. I think it's going to be a unique uh, experience because this is hands-on type of a program that's very unique and has not been tried anywhere else. So uh, this is a unique opportunity for those that are eager to learn uh, new techniques, new technologies uh, with hands-on experience, and particularly get involved in, in the latest advances in the vascular and endovascular medicine. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this program. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Lumsden. I'm the Chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And I'm Zvonimir Krasier, current President of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. We are excited to invite you to join us for our first annual ISEVS Symposium. This premier conference will take place at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. This is a two and a half day conference 
and it will offer didactic lectures from well-renowned cardiovascular interventionists. It will also feature intensive hands-on workshops designed to teach interventionists a variety of techniques. We plan to offer three tracks, one for the novice or the uh, new young surgeon or young interventionist, an intermediate track and an advanced track. That means you can hone your skills at an individualized level. By the end of the conference, attendees should be ready to apply these techniques and improve their clinical practice. We hope you will join us and we look forward to seeing you in September.